Let's turn back the clock to election night in 2016. I would bet that everyone here has a distinct memory or image that you'll always associate with that night. For me, it occurred early the next morning after a night of little sleep when my twin 10-year-old daughters came bounding into our room and up onto our bed. Their eyes were so bright. Their smiles were so big. Is Hillary president now, they asked us? No. Donald Trump won, we had to tell them. Their faces fell. Their eyes teared up. It was so painful. That is a look I never want to see again. That is a sentence I never want to say again. That is why I'm here, and that is why you are here, so that together we can create a new story, one in which we are the winners in 2020 and beyond. And I believe we can do this. I believe that many of the dozens of folks running for our party's nomination can do this. I believe a gay Midwestern mayor can beat Trump. I believe an African-American senator can beat Trump. I believe a Western governor, a female senator, a member of Congress, a Latino Texan, or a former vice president can beat Trump. But I don't believe a self-described democratic socialist can win, nor a democratic party that embraces those views or allows itself to be easily labeled or defined by them. So this morning, I want to focus not on who the nominee should be, but on how Democrats can make our best case to dump Trump and win widely down ballot. In short, Democrats must have a strategy that enables us to win everywhere. Such a winning strategy requires a broad coalition, a resonant cause, and a real-world conversation. Let's start with the coalition. For Democrats to win in purple and red places, we need the broadest possible combination of voter groups. The danger is that we run up the score in blue places, but fall short everywhere else. Let me underscore this by returning to Election Day 2016, but before we knew the outcome. Imagine you couldn't take the stress, so as the polls started to close, you went to see a movie, which in retrospect probably would have been a good idea. You come out and you flip on the TV and you hear just one, one data point. You hear that Hillary beat Trump by a combined seven million votes in California, New York, and Massachusetts. And the TV pundit describes how Hillary won those states by two million more votes than Obama did in 2012. You started rejoicing. You popped the champagne cork. Well, Clinton did crush Obama's 2012 margin in those three states, but she did far worse everywhere else by nearly three million votes. We will crush it again in California, New York, and Massachusetts. Of that, I'm certain. That is how strong the passion against Trump is in deep blue America, and my God, we need and love that passion. But it is not enough. The blue state passion is not enough to win the presidency, as you'll hear from Jim Messina and Jen Psaki. It's not enough to hold the House, as our discussion with the 2018 congressional winners will tell us. It's not enough to win statewide in many states, as Heidi Heidkamp, Governor Lujan Grisham, and the party leaders of the Blue Wall states will make clear. It's not enough to mobilize communities of color, as Steve Benjamin and Akuna Cook are describing. It's just not enough. Outside of some cobalt blue districts and states, we cannot afford a strategy aimed mainly at the furthest left Democrats. There are not nearly enough of them. Take the must-win states of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, which of course we lost by about 77,000 votes. 
the ideological breakdown of those three states, 26% liberal, 34% conservative, and 39% moderate. So in 2020, if all the liberals vote for the Democrat and all the conservatives vote for Trump, we will need to win a supermajority, 61% of the moderate voters to win in those states. Such a supermajority will include a mix of men and women, white voters and people of color, old and young, some Democrats, some independents, and a few Republicans. That is not a far left strategy. That is a partisan plus persuadable strategy. What about other potential battlegrounds, like Arizona? That state is even less blue, 27% liberal, 41% conservative, and 32% moderate. If the liberals and the conservatives stick with their parties, we will need to get 72% of the moderate voters to win, 72%. North Carolina, we need to capture 70% of moderates. Georgia, 68%. Florida, 64% of moderates. These all require a partisan plus persuadable strategy. And here's the good news. We know it works. Partisan plus is how we won in 2018. When we flipped 40 House seats to make Nancy Pelosi speaker, 33 were flipped by candidates endorsed by the moderate House New Democrats. Zero were flipped by candidates endorsed and supported by the Sanders style, our revolution. Zero. This rising generation of mainstream swing district candidates bring dynamism and diversity to our party. And impressive members like Abigail Spanberger, Alyssa Slotkin, Soshi Torres Small, Colin Allred, Lucy McBath, Sharice Davids, Kendra Horn, and Joe Cunningham. The inclusive coalitions they built enabled them to win in some very tough places. Lizzie Fletcher now holds a Texas seat that was occupied by Republicans since George H.W. Bush won it in 1966. And as Stephanie said yesterday, Lauren Underwood is an African-American Democrat representing an 86% white district in a seat that had been held by former speaker Denny Hastert. So, how do we replicate these wins and assemble a broad partisan plus coalition for this new political era? Much, much will depend on the economic cause that Democrats champion. And today we must choose between two starkly different causes to carry to voters. In short, are we going to end or mend capitalism? Do we want to socialize much of the economy by making all of healthcare a government program, providing a guaranteed federal job, as well as a universal basic income? Or will we show voters that we're focused on reforming capitalism so that it provides opportunity for all? No Democrat is satisfied with the status quo. No one. And all agree that we need to offer big ideas to deal with the disruption that we're facing. But big and bold are not synonyms for good. There are plenty of big ideas that might sound good from inside a blue bubble, but widely miss the mark. And carrying the wrong ideas would be fatal in the battle against Trump. Take the foundational proposal of Sandersism, single payer health care. It would eliminate private health insurance by repealing and replacing the ACA, even though the ACA has brought the number of uninsured to its lowest level in U.S. history. While beloved in a handful of academic circles, what's the real world political verdict on single payer so far? It has been tested and it has failed. In 2016, in the same election in which Hillary won the state, Colorado had a Medicare for All style initiative on the ballot. 79% of Coloradans voted no. 79%. Vermont, yes, Vermont, passed a single payer bill in 2011. The Democratic governor abandoned it 
three years later because the costs and tax increases were too high. In 2018, counting every single race of the nearly 100 on the DCCC's red to blue list, only two Democrats ran ads touting Medicare for all. Both lost in highly winnable districts. So yes, this signature far left idea when championed by Democrats is politically potent for Republicans. We should not be running on these ideas. We should be running from them. So what would a cause that resonates far more broadly look like? It requires an obsessive focus on what most Americans experience as their central economic challenge. Some in Washington and academia have identified income inequality as that defining problem. And indeed, inequality is dangerously high. But it is not the concentration of wealth that worries most Americans. It's the concentration of opportunity. That is the kitchen table, not faculty lounge economic concern for many voters. For most people, acutely so for those in underserved communities that face structural inequities and discrimination, the opportunity to earn a good life is simply out of reach. We got a stunning example of the concentration of opportunity earlier this year. Back in January, the New York Borough of Queens drove away 25 Amazon and its 25,000 high paying jobs. When that happened, local activists cheered. One month later, in Lordstown, Ohio, General Motors took away 5,000 jobs. When that happened, local activists wept. Here's the difference. Between 2000 and 2016, tiny queens added more private sector jobs than the states of Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin combined. That is our biggest economic challenge, a devastating concentration of opportunity, the steady erosion of the dignity, ubiquity, and value of hard work. And even if you live in Queens and you're African American or Latin X, or you don't have a college degree, finding a job that supports a good life can be very tough. So how then should we as Democrats respond? Our passion and purpose must be ensuring that all Americans have a real shot at earning a good life in the digital age. This cause must not resemble 1960s Nordic style socialism, but it cannot be warmed over 1990s centrism either. Back then we placed too much trust in the market's ability to provide a real, reliable and realistic path to prosperity for most Americans. In the last 30 years, we've seen the impact of automation and globalization on our workers, and it is clear that a rising tide will not lift all boats. To lift everyone, everywhere, it's time for a new generation of ideas with a singular focus, helping Americans to earn more in a modern market-driven economy. We should transfer wealth from corporations to workers by requiring employers to give everyone a funded, portable private pension separate from and alongside Social Security. We should provide $1 trillion in low-cost loans to Main Street and to women and minority entrepreneurs so that affordable capital isn't available only to the wealthiest capitalists. We should create a 50-state program to offer 1 million new apprenticeships annually so that the only route to a good life doesn't run through a four-year college. We should rebalance the rewards of capital and labor with a massive tax cut on work, a permanent working wage break paid for in part by raising the estate tax. And we should provide universal coverage while also taking the radical but necessary step of capping everyone's health care costs based on their income. That would be a huge change, allowing people to keep a lot more of what they earn and providing security and stability. And yes, we can do this by building on, not blowing up the ACA. 
These are the kinds of ideas that would give many Americans far more earning power as soon as Democrats regain power. These are the kind of ideas that will reform, not reject capitalism for this century, as the progressive New Dealers and Great Society did in the last. And crucially for our politics, ideas like these, built around the cause of renewing opportunity in the digital age, can deliver us the votes to build majorities. Okay, so we need a broad coalition and a big but also resonant cause to run on against Trump and Trumpism. What could stand in our way? This. Candidates might believe that the conversation going on in here represents the views and values of most voters. If they believe that, they are wrong. The online world and the world of even Democratic primary voters are very different. Let's talk Twitter, because that's probably how many candidates start their day. They grab the phone off the bedside table, or they pry it from the hands of an aide, and they check Twitter. What must candidates remember before they log on? That only one in 10 Democratic primary voters regularly posts on that medium, and that three quarters of Democratic primary voters have never posted. Just 30% of Democrats on Twitter are moderate. In the real world of actual Democratic primary voters, it's 50%. Five out of every 15 Democratic voters on Twitter have protested at a rally in the last year. In the real world of Democratic primary voters, it's just one in 15. I do not mean to pick on Twitter users, but we should all probably keep in mind a simple rule. If you are talking with your thumbs, you're probably not talking to the people who make majorities. A broad coalition, a resonant cause, and the right conversation. That is the essence of a strategy that will enable victory everywhere. So as we gather here in South Carolina, let us think together deeply about the question that is existential to our democracy. How do we win? in 2020? How do we remove a dangerous president, secure majorities down ballot, and ultimately forge a new politics for this new era? As Frederick Douglass wrote, shortly after the firing on Fort Sumter, which is just across the harbor from us, I think that's the right direction, quote, we cannot see the end from the beginning, end quote, but begin we must to chart a new course for our party and our people one that can win everywhere. Not because we are Democrats, but because we are Americans who want our beloved country back. Let tonight's announcement in Florida be the beginning of the end of the reign of Trump.